May 2002. The Intel Pentium 4 was riding high with blistering clock speeds of up to 2.53 GHz, and The Elder Scrolls Morrowind was just released. For the PC gamer, the GeForce 4 TI4600 was the fastest GPU on the market, but for many OEM systems being sold, integrated graphics took care of display tasks. At the time, the options for integrated graphics were NVIDIA's GeForce 2 MX GPU on the Enforce 220 and 420 chipsets, and ATI's A3 chipset for the Athlon XP, or there was Intel's 815 chipset graphics for the Pentium 3. While there were integrated graphics options for the Pentium 4 from smaller companies like SIS and VIA, Intel themselves did not provide integrated graphics for the platform. That is, until the 845G series of chipsets codenamed Brookdale. These chipsets introduced Intel's new graphics core, dubbed Extreme Graphics. Technically, the core was recycled from Intel's mobile 830M and 830MG chipsets for Pentium 3 laptops, but this was the first time the architecture appeared on a desktop. The core features twin pixel pipelines clocked at 200MHz and included full support for DirectX 6 and OpenGL 1.3, with partial support for DirectX 7. There was also partial MPEG-2 decoding acceleration for DVD quality video. By and large, the biggest weakness of the Extreme Graphics was its lack of hardware transformation and lighting, which makes the CPU carry much more of the graphics load than with a solution like the GeForce 2 MX that took care of these calculations. With specs like these, it's clear the Extreme Graphics weren't built for gaming, but I game on things that weren't meant to be gamed on, so let's see what kind of mileage we can get out of this old relic. Kicking things off with some racing games, we have RVGL showing respectable performance at 800x600, but this is a well-optimized game that runs on much older computers than this. Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2 is very playable, but only at the lowest resolution and fairly low settings. Sadly, the next game in the series, Underground, is a joke on this hardware. The original Flatout fared a bit better, but only the most stalwart low-end gamer would find it playable. If you'd rather play some Unreal Engine 1 games, the Extreme Graphics does rather well here. The original Unreal Tournament leaves something to be desired at 720p, but if you're willing to reduce the resolution to 800x600, you'll have a much better time. UT2004 does much worse though, and even on a small map with one bot, the game is unenjoyable. Killing Floor is even worse, averaging 7fps when there is 3D rendering happening, and only climbing to around 30fps in the 2D only shop. Serious Sam, the second encounter might look acceptable from the numbers you see here, but it suffers from uneven frame pacing that makes the game an eye strain, at least outdoors. Tribes 2 could be a bit better, but I've personally played with this PC at a LAN party and it fares a bit better when a more powerful computer is serving as the host. If id Tech 3 games are more appealing to you, you can definitely play them on extreme graphics. I've been playing through Jedi Academy for the first time on this PC and it's been mostly solid, with a few frame rate drops here and there. Last up is SimCity 4, which might look unpleasant from the frame rates you see here, but is actually fine as long as you're not using U Drive It mode. You can always turn down the settings for more performance as well if the defaults aren't to your liking. I also tried out the 2 times anisotropic filtering the chip supports in RVGL, and saw about a 25% decrease in performance compared to regular bilinear filtering. As you can see from these screenshots, it does make textures look significantly better, but I personally find the performance penalty too steep. These poor graphics struggle enough as it is. The hardware doesn't support anti-aliasing, but I expect that would make matters even worse. Another thing to be aware of is a strange driver glitch where exiting back to the desktop from an OpenGL game will usually result in, well, this. Changing the resolution fixes it, but it's an annoying bug that will never be fixed, at least not by Intel. So how do I feel about gaming on the extreme graphics? Well, I didn't come into this video expecting too much, and that's exactly what I got, at least from games newer than 2003. If you're expecting games like Killing Floor to play well on integrated graphics of this age, you're gonna have a bad time. With that said, Intel never meant for PCs with these chipsets to be gaming machines. They were meant for web browsing, office work, and watching DVDs. So let's take a look at the Extreme Graphics video acceleration capabilities. Officially, the Extreme Graphics offloads the motion compensation step of the MPEG-2 decoding pipeline for 30fps video at a resolution of 720x480. In other words, the graphics can help out when watching DVD quality video. 
I created some test videos to experiment with and found that the extreme graphics reduced the CPU utilization during playback by more than 50% on average for DVD quality video, which is nothing to sneeze at. I upped the ante by testing 60 FPS video at the same resolution, and the decoding acceleration made a less stark but still respectable difference, and allowed the CPU to hit 0% utilization at points. I tried out 720p 30 video in MPEG-2, but it was too much for the extreme graphics to handle. Rather disappointing when you consider that the 2GHz Pentium 4 can handle the same video entirely in software. Ultimately, the MPEG-2 acceleration is a welcome feature to have, but it doesn't make a noticeable difference in terms of playback fluidity. It simply won't help this PC play any videos it can't play in software, especially because the only time you'll really see MPEG-2 in the real world is on a DVD. At the time, though, this wasn't a problem, as the H.264 standard had not yet been finalized and MPEG-2 was much more common. That's how I feel about the extreme graphics as a whole. By today's standards, they're hopelessly outdated, and most people would scoff at the idea of using them daily. But back in 2002, this little chipset was everything it was meant to be. Cheap graphics for OEMs that could handle day-to-day -day tasks, and DVD playback with ease, and a light game from time to time. So, if you have an old PC with extreme graphics sitting unused in a closet, pull it out, dust it off, and try some classic games on it. It won't wow you with realistic visuals or near instant response time, but it's fun all the same. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.